Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining me today. It's a pleasure again for me to talk today uh, at the Jenkins Conference. I gave a talk yesterday. I'm not sure. If, was anyone at my talk yesterday? Okay, a couple of you. A couple of slides might seem a bit familiar, um, but I've tried to keep it a bit different. So thank you for joining me today. My name is Sufian Kazi. Uh, people call me Suf because it's only got three letters. So it's easier to pronounce. Um, if you want to come and see me later, I'm at the Pivotal booth. Uh, we're going to be around for the rest of the day as long as the event is on. So I work for a company called Pivotal. Uh, I've had a journey throughout my career starting at um, this very small company called IBM, no one's probably heard of, and I moved through from a couple of other companies. I started off as a software developer, uh, progressed to a software architect, and I was always involved in the creation and build of software, generally customer-facing software, so I was never in any labs of these organizations. So I was always building software that someone needed or someone relied upon. And now I work at a company called Pivotal, um, and for, the, for those of you who've never heard of Pivotal, um, if you've heard of technology like the Spring Framework for Java, that's Pivotal technology. If you've heard of RabbitMQ, that's also Pivotal. If you've heard of Redis, that's also Pivotal. And I have to give this speech a lot because generally people don't associate those open source products with us as a company. And we do believe in open source a lot. Um, we also have a product called Cloud Foundry, which will be uh, the, the main uh, topic of what I'm going to talk about today and how it integrates with uh, Jenkins and the work we're doing with the Cloud Bees, Cloud Bees the company. So um, just a big, bit of a high-level brief about Pivotal specifically. Um, we believe in helping organizations in three different areas. Um, we believe every company wants to build software. And the reason they want to build software is they want to release products into the marketplace that helps them become competitive but also delivers value to their customers and builds a relationship with them. Uh, we help companies in that situation by helping them learn agile techniques. We have an agile Pivotal Labs team who built Pivotal Tracker, if any of you are familiar with it. Um, when we say help, our team work uh, in a mechanism called pair programming, where typically it's one Pivotal employee working side by side with a company's development team. They get to create a product at the end of it, but they get to walk away learning Pivotal's techniques and way of building software, and they become self-sufficient. In the organization that's creating software, whether it's using our techniques or any agile uh, development practice, typically creates data. So we support this by having solutions in the data space for uh, providing uh, solutions for understanding big data and fast data. So we have an in-memory database, uh, which, is WAN, uh, which replicates data across a WAN called Gemfire. Uh, we have data science teams. These are proper scientists with uh, PhDs in physics and mathematics, not IT people pretending to be data people, who help organizations understand trends and patterns in data. And when you combine this together, the, the ability to create software fast and the ability to understand data, we help companies evolve in a cycle where using insights they've gained, they can add improvements back into their application. And to add those improvements back in a, in a quick and speedy way, they need an agile platform or agile environment. And that's where our cloud platform, Cloud Foundry, fits in, which is a software you can use internally within your organization or uh, pointing in a public cloud or private cloud to help you manage your infrastructure, but provide a seamless way for hosting and running apps. Seamless meaning you get immediate environment creation. And that's where we're working with CloudBee specifically, and I'll explain a bit more as we go on. So, Today, um, unlike yesterday's talk, I'm going to specifically talk about a, a scenario where we've got a, a, a customer organization. There's a chap called Henry. Henry's the business owner. So what is on Henry's mind? Well, Henry wants to make, uh, he's, he's got an idea he wants to release into the marketplace. And that idea is a new software application. It needs to be built fairly quickly, fairly rapidly. In fact, in a matter of eight weeks. So he specifically knows what the application should do. That's his driving force. It's his baby. But what he also knows is that there's a competition out there who needs to get the same idea or a similar idea out in the marketplace soon. And that's hence his eight weeks timeline. He needs to get the, get the product out there and get it tested and get it usable, get it usable in the market as soon as he can. So to achieve his goal, he's entrusted the task to um, Jane, his application architect. Um, so let's have a look at Jane. Jane has a few concerns. In fact, she's more than because she's quite, a, quite worried, worried quite a lot. So one of the problems in her organization is not everyone understands Agile. In fact, Agile is a bit of an overused word. What does it really mean? You know, I've talked about Agile at the beginning. It's not just having a, de a, a development team who is Agile and use Agile techniques. It's about speed and pace. Her organization isn't used to working at pace. And definitely, this task is setting them quite, high, quite a high challenge. 
and also whether they can achieve that task of creating the software that Henry needs, they've got to release it, they've got to create the environments to support that software and run that, run that software. And generally that takes a long time in her organization. There's many different teams involved in many different processes. So pretty much in general, eight weeks is a long time for her to get something into production. So it's, it's t isn't enough time, in fact, to get, get something into production. Typically, it's a six-month cycle. So she went away and she read a few books. Maybe some of you have, are familiar with some of these books. Um, really good books on this topic, but they are just books after all. So she went away and she learned to read about the Phoenix Project, read about other people's problems, understood the issues. But that doesn't really solve her issue within her own organization. So she was still stuck. Fundamentally, the message she got from this was continuous delivery, continuous delivery. This, this idea kept buzzing around her head, continuous delivery. So what does that mean? So she had a look at her company and, and the stats, and she pulled some stats from GitHub and said, well, you know, they push a lot of code, um, they do a lot of builds, they do a lot of deploys. So maybe they're doing this thing called continuous delivery. Already. But actually not. Continuous delivery is not the same as continuous deployment. So if I use a quote from uh, a couple of years ago, um, this is a, a quote I like, continuous delivery doesn't mean every change is deployed to production as soon as possible. Every change must be proven to be deployable. So you still can't just go through a cycle of releasing and publishing things. You need to be able to understand, okay, is it ready, is it, is it the right thing? The key thing that you need to, we need to have in this process is who is responsible for deciding this is ready to be released into production? If we're gonna go through this cycle, we need to have some kind of uh, process in place, or some, ki some kind of way of checking, uh, checking balance and checking the process along the way. Now let's have a look at Jane's specific issues in her organization. I hope maybe some of them are some of the issues you have as well. Jane is at a starting point and she needs to get to the finish line. And there's a few obstacles. First thing is cycle time. Anything she needs to do always has a kind of a cycle time associated with it. There's a cycle in terms of how long it's gonna take a developer to write the first draft of the, or the first prototype of the code. And then there's a cycle associated with someone reviewing that and assessing it. Uh, does it meet the quality standards of that organization? Is it what Henry wanted in the first place? And then there's another cycle, which is to go back and amend that code. There's a cycle to actually create the environment where that code is gonna run. It's just delay upon delay upon delay. Um, fundamentally, she asked herself, you know, how long does it take me to deploy a single line of code to production? And if when you break it down to that, that small uh, metric, that's when the problem kind of hits home. You know, just to deploy one line sometimes can take a long time and can't, isn't a, a, a next day activity. The other problem she has are buildings like these. Well, not specifically these buildings, but silos. It's groups of people who just work in their own area and their own team. You've got the release management team, you've got the environment build team, you've got the dev team, not necessarily always talking to each other, not always communicating with each other either. So this creates another problem for her because in order to achieve something, she has to go and uh, solve uh, and communicate with different areas of her organization who often have different points of view and maybe don't share a, someone, a, a common uh, uh, idea or common ideal. Now they have a DevOps team, so that's kind of cool. Right? So that's kind of slightly uh, more modern, slightly impressive. But when she went to speak to them, they mentioned something like a process. They've got a process. And if, they needed, and if she needs the help, she's gonna go and raise a ticket. And that doesn't really help her. She doesn't wanna raise a ticket, she wants to talk to someone and solve a problem. She needs things done. And the other thing, feedback loop. She isn't confident that her organization are comfortable taking risks or are comfortable in questioning what they're doing and comfortable in questioning um, is the process that they've built or put in place the right thing? Are they, in a, are they the kind of company who can question that something is the right process or the right, right, right way of achieving something? Or are they stuck that that's the process and that's the way it's gotta be done? This is all making her very, even more anxious. So she needs to keep calm a little bit. The other big issue she's got is this whole new release. Is, it's effectively changing something. Henry's idea is changing what's currently there and live in production and already running. And change is bad because what change does, it, it, it's likely to cause the production instance to go down. It's gonna cause downtime. It's gonna break the, the environment. And that scares a lot of people as well. And that causes people to put delays and, 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 and cause meetings and meetings and meetings, etc. So she needs some help, it seems unsurmountable, so how can she, how can she uh, tackle this problem? 
So there's, at Pivotal, we try to promote a few strategies for success. And fundamentally, this is about changing the way companies build software or the style of software that they build. Um, so a few of the topics I'm going to talk about, I actually ref referenced this website here. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of it, 12factor.net. It's actually created by uh, Heroku. The principle, these are design principles about designing applications in a more modern way, suited for cloud environments and suited for modern uh, styles of application development. So I don't want to go through every single 12 factor here. Let's go through a couple of the key principles. Do continuous, uh, sorry, do implement continuous integration. So don't have a setup where people are checking out code from the main code, code release and then keeping it checked out for days on end. Because then you end up in situations where someone is writing uh, other bits of the application relying on what they see is the current version, but meanwhile, there's a new version coming in, and when that comes, gets, gets checked back in, it's gonna break what they've just released. Fundamentally, you need to keep these cycles or these gaps short, continuously integrate, continuously bringing things back together again. Uh, and you know, effectively, there's one code base, and that should become your master. Keep that code base as nice, closely knit as possible. Yes, you may deploy it to multiple environments, but that should be one unique code base, and be confident in that code base. The other thing to consider is the way you package your code into, a, into an application or, a or, or, or an artifact that gets deployed. Try to uh, keep one a single artifact, which is common to whichever environment you're deploying to, whether it be production, development, or test. Don't make environment-specific packages which have, okay, this is the, the artifact with the application that's also got the config for development. And then this is, now, we need another artifact for test. That, you're going wrong if you're going down that route. That's just introducing new problems. On a similar theme, configuration within your application. Don't have configuration within your application externalize it. The application, if it does have configuration, then it will need to change per environment. So you'll have a config file for your production and config file for your development. If you keep it separate and, and build your app in a way where it can uh, get those credentials injected, then you're making your app more portable. You're eliminating some of the processes involved, uh, specifically manual steps of modifying and changing things. Automation. Automation is also important as well. Manual steps cause delays and cause problems. Using a tool like uh, Jenkins Enterprise or other uh, automation tools like Cloud Foundry, which I'll talk about, help you and simplify things. Make things run a bit smoother and help eliminate uh, manual errors uh, as well. And then this question of feedback as well I mentioned before. You know, We've mentioned the word continuous a lot, continuous a lot. Engage in continuous improvement. Question what we're doing. If, or if you feel there's a problem in the processes that you've got in place, be, feel free to say, okay, well, we need to change this. Don't be, feel uh, locked into a single process just because it's the way you've always done things in the past. Okay. Now, whatever process you do, try and be consistent at least. You know, if it's worked in one environment, you, then use that over and again. Try and use the same process over and over again. Don't try and change things for every environment because that's where other problems are gonna uh, come along as well. Now, I don't know how many of you can feel that the, the environment where you're hosting your app is something that you can dispose of freely. Are you uncomfortable about disposing that environment? Is it because hey, actually, we know that app works in development because Bob went in last week and made, he made some changes. Well, what were those changes and where did he make them? Has he made them to all the environments? So can you be, can you be confident that that environment that's configured and, and is running your code is actually, that same application can run in another environment? And if you can't, then you're going to in introduce new problems. You're going to have the scenario where it works in development and that same code when you move to production or, to, or any other environment suddenly doesn't break and something because somewhere in that environment there's a problem. You need to be able to confident to say, hey, I'm going to blow the environment today. I know you've been testing on it for two days. I'm going to blow it again and start and carry on the next set of tests. And you should be confident to know that that, applica that application will still behave the way you expected it to. And in the same way, uh, I'm talking a lot about application changes. Application changes synonymously, synonymously happen at the same time as a database change. Try to automate those changes as well in the same way you automate changes to your application. And then what are you deploying? Are you deploying a big monolith or are you deploying smaller 
bits of technology, microservices. Monoliths are bad in many ways, but you know, they just create big problems. There's a lot of risk involved in here, a lot of things that could go wrong. If you break things down into smaller chunks, you can make your job a bit more manageable, where you can uh, focus on specific areas and isolate issues if they were to come up and try to understand what was the problem point, so what was it that caused this issue. Uh, automation of testing is also important, as well as the configuration of environments. Uh, the earlier you can spot tests, the better you're going to be. So if you can automate tests by using some kind of JUnit framework or something like that, you're going you're to put yourself in a better place. And then tools. Pick a good tool. Pick good tools that help support you and help drive what you're trying to achieve. But don't constantly keep changing your tools. Once you've selected it, make that the tool. One tool is good. Be happy with it. Now, um, I'm obviously, I'm slightly biased, but I believe Cloud Foundry is an ideal place to help Jane here. So let's explore this a little bit. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry is a platform as a service solution. It creates a platform dynamically to host and run applications and a platform dynamically to host and run services like um, uh, databases and, and configuration environments. And it does it in seconds. So uh, I'll try and do a demo as well later today. I did one yesterday where basically from the point of needing an environment, literally five to 10 seconds later, the environment is there. And the full process of deploying and configuring it probably takes uh, minutes, a couple of minutes. So that's going to help Jane. Great. The process it applies to create an environment is the same. It doesn't change whether you're doing test or prod or development. It's a consistent process. So um, she gets a disposable environment, and she knows that every time it's, it's been getting created in Cloud Foundry, it's going to be the same as what she expects it to be. And her mechanism to instruct Cloud Foundry, the API, in other words, to automate and, and deploy um, uh, her, her application to Cloud Foundry is consistent and fairly simple as well to use. And that means she can embed that API in tools like Jenkins or other uh, tools like that. What Cloud Foundry helps as well is it injects configuration dynamically into an environment. So what this means for Jane is she can push her application to her development environment in Cloud Foundry and it will pick up the development specific credentials in real time. They'll be injected by Cloud Foundry into the app. Then she can take that same code base and push it to test and the, uh, the test credentials are pushed in. So in other words, if there's a different database environment, a different queuing environment, the app should just seamlessly work because it's not hard it doesn't have anything hard-coded. It's just getting those credentials passed into it by the supporting platform. And in the same way as uh, configuration dependencies, so uh, if one uh, smaller application relies on another microservice, they get injected in the same way. Um, And the, pro the process of promoting applications from, environment, from one environment to another environment is, a, is the same process as well, absolutely identical, uh, and giving her that overall feeling of consistency that she needs. So if we just summarize some of those points up, Cloud Foundry is giving uh, Jane a couple of new options. Cloud Foundry supports this idea of canary deployment. So where she needs to upgrade and maintain her environment, Cloud Foundry is never going to bring anything down. If it needs to upgrade one of its internal clusters or servers, it always start, brings up a clone copy alongside it, which is the newer version, allowing you to test and validate it's OK, and then we'll take down the old version. And that's the idea of canary deployment. And it applies that process to applications as well. If you're releasing a new version of an application, it allows you to release the new version alongside the old one, giving you zero downtime. So when the, the new version is up, you can test it, validate it OK, then slowly bring down the old one, and your end users aren't affected. There's always some service available. This means also in the testing phases, you can test uh, version A, version B simultaneously, make sure everything is OK. And Cloud Foundry allows you to scale your applications on demand. Um, so you can do that either manually or you can instruct Cloud Foundry to automatically scale as needed based on load and based on um, how busy your application is. A 
So coming back to what Pivotal is about, uh, agile development and agile deployment is, is great, but agile, an agile infrastructure is what support, is, is supporting all of this. And by supplying agile infrastructure, Jane's team are in a better position. So um, let's talk a little bit about the architecture of Cloud Foundry. So there's a lot of boxes on this diagram here, but fundamentally, at the top are users who want to interact with applications. These applications run within Cloud Foundry, and Cloud Foundry is made up of multiple components. Cloud Foundry allows you to run your apps and your configuration on different types of infrastructure. Windows is always something we're gonna hopefully support in the future, it's not currently there, but what we do currently support is Amazon Web Services, OpenStack, uh, VMware Cloud Services, and uh, Google Cloud. So effectively it means you can run and host your apps in your own data center, using VMware or OpenStack, or in a public data center like Amazon or Google. From an application perspective, it doesn't make a difference. It's just running in a Cloud Foundry environment. From a CI and a CD pipeline perspective, it doesn't make a difference. You're just integrating with Cloud Foundry and saying, here, give me an environment to host and run this app. And it could be on any one of those uh, uh, backend infrastructures. And alongside there, we have a box which are, uh, some of you at the back can't read, which is called service brokers. Service brokers are also fairly important. Service brokers are uh, a concept within Cloud, Cloud Foundry, which is a facade layer, a mechanism for you to access other backend technologies like uh, a database, a, a messaging system, or a mechanism for you to uh, trigger um, other external features like a monitoring tool, for instance. And we've worked with a lot of companies to build out-of-the-box service brokers, which we ship with our enterprise version of Cloud Foundry. So for example, we have a lot of uh, service brokers for our own Pivotal products. We have service brokers for uh, other companies we work with, such as MySQL, MongoDB, Memcache, Elasticsearch, Cassandra. And we're quite open to the kinds of organizations we work with. We wanted to make it a, a framework. And obviously the one circle there is we're working with CloudBees, which allows you to enable a cloud manager to manage and deploy a Jenkins instance for you. The key to all of this is, you know, effectively Cloud Foundry is a DevOps tool. It has a developer UI and it has an operations UI. The Ops Manager UI allows you to instruct uh, Cloud Foundry to talk to the infrastructure layer to create VMs. It's a simple point and click UI. It's, um, it, it doesn't exist in our open source version of the product. So it's core pivotal pr uh, product itself. And through point and click in the UI, you are then instructing Cloud Foundry to talk to that infrastructure layer to automate a series of actions, like give me a, couple, a new environment. So let's have a look at this. I'm gonna go into a demo in a bit, so let's come back to the demo uh, and show you the user interface of Cloud Foundry. This is the operations UI. What I've done is I've clicked on my Jenkins uh, environment over here, and uh, here I'm controlling uh, I'd like, I've asked Cloud Foundry to create me a master node and a slave node. And I can control here and say, okay, give me one instance of a master, one slave node, and I can control how much CPU, how much RAM, and how much resources. And then in turn, when I apply these changes, Cloud Foundry will talk to the infrastructure and create that for me. So I've already done this. I can click on the status tab here, and that's gonna go off and query my infrastructure, and it's returning to me the fact that I've got two nodes running. And it gives me an idea of how heavy or how light it they are, they, are, they are loaded. And also as an operator, I can view the credentials to administer and log on to that box uh, directly. Whereas my developers, they never get to see this. They get to see a running Jenkins Enterprise and it looks no, other, no different to any other Jenkins system. They can do the normal stuff they'd expect to see in Jenkins by creating Bob, uh, jobs sorry, and linking them to, together, creating pipelines, etc. cetera. So that, that's made life really easy for them. So let's do something a little bit different here. Oops, skip through these slides. So I've got this cool dude in the, in the middle here. So I'm gonna do a repeated demo that I did yesterday. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, try and do it live. Yesterday I did it as a video recording. Hopefully the Wi-Fi connection will hold up. And effectively the demo I'm gonna do is a pipeline using Jenkins and Cloud Foundry and Artifactory. I've got one job in Jenkins which uh, gets my application source code and builds an artifact and stores it in Artifactory. So it's my single package, which I can release to any environment. And I have another job, which is gonna fetch that artifact and deploy it to a Cloud Foundry environment. The key thing is, I'm gonna just deploy it to one environment here in Cloud Foundry, 
But the process is identical whether I'm going to dev, test, or prod, or whichever. So as long as it works in one, it's, it, it just means you're scalable and you're flexible and, and you can adapt it. So hopefully the Wi-Fi works. Um, I currently have an application running on Cloud Foundry. And it's a very simple app. It lists some cities. And I can click on the individual cities and view a map of where they are. Generally, these are cities in Texas. So if I just test it, if the internet is OK, hopefully if I do a refresh. No, it isn't OK. So let's just click on that. Try that again. No, OK. Live demos don't do them, right? So let's trust the, the video. And if I walk through the video, I know that will work. Apologies for that. The, um, I think I must have a Wi-Fi issue, I suppose. Now, effectively, the demo I was going to do was seamlessly push, go from one version of my app to another. So one version being something I'm calling the blue version, and the new one being the green version. What Cloud Foundry enables you to do is to deploy an app and to map public URLs to that application. So currently, I have a, a app which is live and running, and I have three copies of it running in Cloud Foundry that are being managed. And I have a URL mapped to it, app.example.com. When I deploy my green version, I can assign it a temporary internal URL only that my customers don't know about. And I can deploy it using the Jenkins uh, plugin, which exists, or using a Jenkins shell, shell task to trigger C uh, API commands to Cloud Foundry. And when I deploy it, I can say, hey, can you deploy this app and give it an internal URL? And then I can access that URL internally and make sure that my app is running and, and, uh, and, ex and exhibiting the behavior I need. Once I'm happy with that, I can then map the public URL to both applications, the blue one and the green one. So now uh, a subset of my user base will access the new version. I can effectively trial it out. I have three copies of the blue and I have one copy of the green. So effectively there's a one in four chance of people accessing it. I can see if it's OK. It's great. And then I can flip it. So in step three, I can say, OK, now let's scale up the green version, have three copies of that and only one copy of the blue, and I can remove the public URL from the blue version, so only the green one is accessible externally, and then I can just delete the blue version, and that's a seamless transition. And when you combine that with something like Jenkins, then you've got a continuous uh, delivery pipeline. So I'll rely on my trusty video. Um, I'll walk through the steps, because I think everyone can't read the text at the back, but basically I've got an existing job which I'm going to use as a template. Uh, I'm going to call this job a promotion step. Um, so I'm promoting from one version of the code to the other. So I'm just going to say at the bottom, hey, can you copy a lot of the configuration from my previous task? Now, if I'm going to do this, I need to make a change to my code. So I'm going to go back to my application. And as you hopefully briefly saw, it was just a listing of cities. The change I want to make is add a filter, a filter button so I can uh, search for specific cities. So to make life easier, I've got a crib sheet here of commands I need to uh, do just to make the demo run smoothly. So this is the form that I want to include. It's currently commented out. So I'm just going to make an amazing change in my code by removing the comments. And I was so excited by this change, I did a little bit of a typo. So let's just ignore that there. I can't spell the word functionality. I've got an extra A in there. Um, so I've added this new functionality, and I'm going to push that code back into GitHub. So that's the new, new version. I'm ready to make that live. So I'm just going to run a couple of Git commands, uh, add the source file back into Git, uh, like so. I should have probably scripted this to make life easier. I'm going to run a commit command. And then I'm going to run the push command, um, which just triggers uh, GitHub to update. I could have configured my job in Jenkins to automatically or periodically poll um, GitHub. But I just, I'm a bit of a control freak, and it's a demo, and I wanted to make sure we could see what's going on. So this task here, it's, it's, this is actually the second half of my pipeline. This just takes a built artifact, and I can pass in parameters of how to connect to Cloud Foundry. And it goes to Artifactory, in my case, and pulls the artifact. And it connects to Cloud Foundry using a script. And I don't like that script I've just copied. I'm going to use a new one called Promotion. So I've got a copy of the script in um, GitHub as well. So I'm just going to paste it into here. So let's have a look at the script. It's called promotion.sha. And it's, it's, it looks horribly complicated, but it's pretty simple. I've got a step in here that says, hey, log into Cloud Foundry as a specific user. And you can pass those in as parameters in your job. And then I'm going to push an application to Cloud Foundry with a couple of parameters. I'm going to give it a name. And I'm going to give it a unique URL. A unique meaning I'm going to include the bill number in the URL as well. 
So this is an internal URL which my internal team can, can test and prove that it's working okay. And then I'm gonna start the app. And then just for demo purposes, I've had a temporary sleep command so we can kind of see the transition happening in real time. Then a bit of code at the bottom, effectively what it's doing is it's looking for the previous version, working out what number it was. And then it's going to map the public URL to the new app. It's gonna scale down the old one so we only have one copy running. And it's gonna scale up the new one to as many copies as requested. In my case, I'm requesting three copies. And then it removes the public root from the old version of the app and deletes that completely so it never, doesn't exist anymore. So this is the script I'm gonna use. I'm just gonna copy it and paste it into uh, my uh, Jenkins pipeline. Put it into there and save. So this is a task which just fetches an artifact and promotes it to Cloud Foundry. I've got another task which goes to GitHub and fetches the code and builds the artifact. Uh, so I'm gonna amend it to call this, this, this new task, this new uh, job sorry, that I've created. So I'm logging into Git, I'm passing in a build number. So I'm just gonna amend this uh, process here to say trigger another build, which is my build to do the promotion step. And say save. And then I can kick this off. Now, I'll, again, I'll explain what's happening on the output because I'm sure some of the text isn't clear, but basically it's gone off to Git to fetch the latest version of code. And when I ran this before, we were on build 26. Now we've incremented to 27. It's now doing a uh, Gradle step just to build my uh, code in a consistent way. And if I flip across to my Cloud Foundry environment, this is a developer's view, I can see 26 is currently running. We've created the artifact, we've sent it to Artifactory. So that's our single gospel of truth which we're gonna use in every environment. And I'm triggering my promote step, and that's gonna kick off in a few seconds. So when I click on this step, uh, I can look at the output, we can see my script in action. So Jenkins went and pulled the artifact from Artifactory, and then it triggered my shell script, which logged into Cloud Foundry uh, as the correct user, the correct environment, dev in my case, and it's starting the push process. So when I refresh here, we can see there's a line called 27. So what Cloud Foundry is doing now is it's creating a container, and the containers are fairly quick to start up, to host my application. But the application isn't there yet, which is why that URL doesn't work. Now it triggers a push step, and what Cloud Foundry is doing is it's dynamically examining the app in real time. So this is kind of the real powerful stuff. Rather than pre-building these VMs or pre-building containers, we build them in, in real time as you need them. So we've looked at the app, we've determined it's a Java application, so we're gonna install Java on the container. We realize it needs a Spring library, so we're gonna fetch those libraries and install them on the container. If I pushed a uh, Ruby app, it would be a similar sequence of events. So it's dynamic, and it means every time you change, if you introduce new functionality, they should be incorporated. And this container, remember, is specific to your app. Um, so it's not gonna be shared by any other uh, instance. When I hit refresh now, and literally in a couple of minutes, I've got the, the app running, it's already configured, I can access it by a URL, and I've got my new functionality, which is the search button. If I go back to Cloud Foundry and press refresh, we can see we've already triggered the steps. 26 no longer has a public root or any kind of root. And if I refresh again, only 27 exists. So what that means is, is that people who are accessing my app, most of them would have been accessed the old version, and we would have kept those sessions running for as long as they logged in but for some users will be hitting the new version. There never was any downtime. We always had a continuous service. Uh, we can access it using the internal URL, 27, or the external face, first customer facing URL. Now we just get the new version of the app with the added functionality in there. And just to confirm, if I hit the old name, that doesn't exist anymore. So combining the two tools here, Cloud Foundry and Jenkins has given this immediate uh, consistent environment and the functionality exists here allowing me to filter, which is really cool. What Cloud Foundry also does, uh, I, I didn't leave the screen long enough, it allows me to scale my app and, and deploy multiple copies of that application as well. So if I was to sum this up, you know, I've shown you a couple of features uh, within Cloud Foundry where it allows us to deploy environments like a Jenkins environment. It allow, also allows you to push applications and you can trigger those pushes from Jenkins. It's automating the, the step of provisioning your infrastructure 
and it injects configuration credentials into your environment as needed. So in my case, my application relied on another microservice. The credentials of how to connect to it, it didn't know that before the application got pushed. How it realized that was Cloud Foundry injected them by creating an environment variable on the container. Likewise, if my app needs access to a database, those credentials are defined in an environment variable. The variable is always the same name, so uh, the app just needs to read the value of that variable and pull out the values and plug it into its uh, config. If you use Spring, or specifically if you use Spring Cloud to build your app, you don't even need to do that step. Spring Cloud will dynamically pull those credentials and inject them in real time. Uh, we use containerization. We use our own container technology. It's called Garden. It's been around for, uh, sorry, Warden, sorry. It's been around for a couple of years. Later on this year, we've been working with the Docker community. We're going to support Docker containers. We've been working with Core OS. We're going to support Rocket containers as well. We want to keep the platform as flexible and open as possible. Uh, whatever system you're using, we give you load balancing and routing for your apps automatically. Uh, and we do health management. If um, one instance of your app was to die, we will rectify that situation and bring up a new instance. If the container dies, we'll rectify that as well. If the VM dies, we'll, we'll rectify that as well. We can do scaling either at a manual level uh, or at an automated level. We've worked with a charity in the UK who use our app for running and hosting their applications. And they, this charity works in a process that typically one night they have a big uh, televised event. I, I can't reveal too many names, but maybe you can guess who it is. And they use Cloud Foundry to host and run their apps. One copy of Cloud Foundry is running at their local infrastructure. And as, it meet, as, the, as the volume of calls reach its peak on that evening, they can then stand up another instance of Cloud Foundry pointing at Amazon, so they get the benefits of elastic scale. The app hasn't changed, it's just got a consistent platform to run on, so they didn't need to write their app, two different versions of their app, one for Amazon and one for uh, their internal environment. Cloud Foundry gives you a service broker mechanism, allowing you to add, uh, connect to different kinds of services. These could be the companies that we work, we, we work with, like Mongo, uh, Cassandra, et cetera, or they could be services you host and run within your own organization, like say your own Oracle database. You can expose those credentials in Cloud Foundry. We centralize and pool all the logging information from your apps into one place, uh, as well as the metrics information. So if you want to monitor your app using uh, App Dynamics or New Relic, it's just one endpoint you need to configure. And as soon as we scale up and give four more copies, they are automatically attached to the monitoring tool. We have built-in security, which is also part of the reason why other container vendors are talking to us. They want to understand why our containers are secure. And we enforce role manage management within our application, uh, uh, software as well. So some of the pipelines I showed you today, I've got them in um, GitHub. If you come over and see me later um, if you need access to them. We're at the pivotal booth outside uh, on the, third, uh, the floor below this. Please do come and visit. I don't know any more about what we do as a company. Um, if you want to know more about uh, Spring and Spring Cloud, we're having a workshop in our offices on the 2nd of July where we're going to walk through an application which is, consists of four microservices written in Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, and we're going to deploy them to Cloud Foundry. Uh, so do feel free to register. It's, it's being organized on meetup.com, and we're going to have uh, other meetups in the future as well, focusing on our data areas. Okay. Thank you guys very much. I hope that was an interesting talk. Are there any questions? Okay, cool. Well, you guys know where to see me. I'm in the booth. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.